Claims of more war crimes in Ukraine. The United Nations calls the latest allegations a horror story. Russian forces are accused of mass killings in the besieged port city of Mariupol. The United Nations says there's growing evidence of war crimes being committed in Ukraine, describing the situation as a horror story. U.S. satellite images allegedly show a mass burial site containing around 200 graves near the besieged southern port city of Mariupol that Russian forces have been trying to fully capture for several weeks. They do control most of the area, but hundreds of Ukrainian troops are still hiding out in the sprawling Azovstal steel plant. Today, President Putin accused Ukrainian leaders of refusing to allow their soldiers to surrender. Our correspondent Catherine Biurahanga has more from, the, from southern Ukraine, a warning her report contains some images you may find upsetting. Haunting, apocalyptic scenes in Mariupol. Russia has bombarded this city into near submission. Once home to about half a million people, thousands are believed to have been killed. Emergency workers from Russia are filmed here, retrieving the dead. Moscow has repeatedly denied that its troops are responsible for the mass killings of civilians in Ukraine. But Mariupol's mayor says some of the worst war crimes have been committed there. They killed 20,000 people. They did it on purpose. This is what I think. They intentionally prevented people from leaving Mariupol. They set this genocide up by closing the city down and using land artillery and airstrikes first, and then the warships that arrived later. But Russian forces have been accused of hiding civilian bodies in mass graves. These satellite images show them appearing over the course of a month. The civilians have been buried in the village of Manhush, outside Mariupol, the southern city which has been besieged and encircled by Russian forces for weeks, seen here in red. The last Ukrainian troops in the city are holed up inside the Azovstal steelworks on Mariupol's coast. 1,000 civilians are still said to be in this sprawling industrial complex. On this missing persons wall, most of the faces and names that you can see are people from Mariupol. And now with the ongoing blockade and with communications cut off, it's almost a miracle for people to get out. Katerina, Valentina and Adezda escaped to Mariupol together on Thursday. Just a handful of people who made it through with a humanitarian convoy. A friendship born out of the horrors of this war. People are risking their lives under fire. They have to because there's no running water, gas or electricity. There is a mosque in the Primorsky district with a well nearby. A lot of people got killed there. They got caught up in shelling. They were just looking for water in the city. But they're safe now and able to rebuild their lives in new cities and countries. The three women we met there at the train station are now safely on their way to Lviv in the west of the country. But what about the conflict for the rest of Ukraine? Ukraine's government has said that comments by a Russian general that Russia wants to take control of the southern part of the country and eastern parts of Moldova show that, it is, that its invasion was about making territorial gains. But Moscow's plans are far from being guaranteed. Its troops have been blocked from reaching the key port city of Odessa and its flagship carrier, the Moskva, sank there last week. Catherine, thank you for that. Catherine Birohanga there in Zaporizhia in central southern Ukraine. Well, miles of defensive trenches have been dug around the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv, as a precaution should Russian troops return. Life is a little less precarious now after the city was successfully defended a few weeks ago. Our correspondent, Mark Lowen, has spent time with Ukrainian troops in the capital. For the defenders of Kyiv, the battle isn't over. This time it's training, but while the enemy has retreated to the east, the danger still looms. Vlad Nekrutenko was a PhD law student until the Russians tried and failed to seize his city. Do you think it is possible that they could come back? 
let's say we lose uh, our positions on Donbass or uh, Lugansk region and uh, then uh, they see that uh, we don't have enough troops and uh, resources to uh, protect uh, Kyiv, uh, they would come back for their initial aim to take over our um, capital and uh, take over our government. In the forests of Kyiv, we can't disclose where, the 131st Battalion is dug in, a crucial line of defence for the capital. How many kilometres oh, or how I many don't, of the know. trenches? Um, 10 kilometres, 20 kilometres, I don't know. Great Britain sent us this weapon. So yes. anti-tank missiles from yes. Britain? Yes, yes. And when was the last time that you used this weapon here? Secret. The Russians were three or four kilometers from us, firing with mortars and artillery. If they return, without our resistance, they could storm through. And they will make an effort to do so again. But I think the residents of Kiev can sleep more soundly, knowing that we are here. A whole infrastructure is in place. Spots where Kiev families would picnic now have new dwellers. Soup. It still feels astonishing to see how a modern European capital has suddenly been taken back to the trench-filled warfare of decades ago. And they're in this for the long haul because they now know that the threat to the very existence of their country will continue. For those dug in, reminders of the life they left behind two months ago, when Russia thought it could barge into Kiev with little resistance and when Ukraine's residents became its protectors. Mark Lowen, BBC News, Kiev. A Ukrainian Londoner who runs a ladies' boutique in Marylebone has swapped designer dresses for flak jackets to help Ukraine. Irina Grant has raised thousands of pounds to provide equipment for the territorial defence in her hometown of Uman. They're civilian fighters helping defend Ukraine from the Russian army and support residents. Aisha Buksh has the story. Irina has run her own ladies' boutique and tailors in Marlebone for over 10 years. But the war in Ukraine has caused her much concern. She was brought up in a town called Uman, 130 miles south of Kyiv, and she still has family there. Every single day I check on them. That's how my day starts. I start with checking the news, what's been happening in Ukraine in the last night. Um, I pray, I, I check on my family. I ask them what they need and um, that's, that's how my days start. In the last few weeks, she's been fundraising to buy military equipment for the local territorial defence, Ukraine's Home Guard. Her customers and local friends have all been donating. And so far, she's raised thousands of pounds and purchased an array of items which were driven out to the Polish-Ukrainian border. We needed the protective equipment, like bulletproof vests, tactical boots. We needed binoculars, we needed night vision goggles, uh, we needed thermal uh, vision goggles, uh, we needed first aid kits. Arena's not the only one in London who's been sourcing military supplies. These Ukrainian Londoners made a supply trip out ahead of the invasion. And of course, the British government also continues to send millions of pounds in military and humanitarian aid. But for Arena, it's a big leap from her day job. It felt really um, very strange having all these designer um, outfits and uh, military equipment in the middle of the boutique with the boxes arriving. I don't know what my, what my clients must have thought of. <laughs> Along with the supplies for the territorial defence, Irina and her family also organised bags of sweets and chocolates to be sent out for local children. She says she will keep raising money for Ukraine for as long as it takes to bring some light and much needed support amid the darkness of war. Aisha Baksh, BBC London.